Hey, my name is Kyle Bromley. I am a cloud solutions architect here at Zerto. Um, I specialize in Microsoft Azure. Uh, joining me kind of last minute is one of my colleagues, Alex Shank. He is the solutions architect at Zerto, mainly specializing in AWS. Uh, we're both certified in that plat our respective platforms. Um, so we're kind of the go-to internally for a lot of different things, but also externally. So we focus not only on pre-sales, but post-sales, uh, new customers, additional customers. Our job is really to help you guys grow, whether you're new or whether you're looking at Zerto, whether you've been with us since the beginning here. Um, that's really our role here, is to help you guys out and be successful with uh, these newer technologies that we're, we're adding in. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I've been with Zerto for almost six years now. Um, I started in support. I came from the University of North Florida in Jacksonville and moved up to Boston, where I've frozen my butt off for the past six years and loved every second of it. Um, I'm also a solutions architect uh, certified in Azure at expert level, so I've done a lot of training on Pluralsight for the past two years and live labs and all that good stuff, so got some good hands-on experience with the platform, uh, as does Alex. Alex actually does know a thing or two about Azure as well, I'm trying to get him to get certified this year so he can help me out with a lot of this stuff. So what we're going to be covering today is uh, pretty much Zerto in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to start with a very surface level nutshell and then just kind of get deeper and deeper. Uh, quick show of hands here, who here is currently using Azure and Zerto? Okay, so we got a pretty decent number of you. Um, who here is kind of planning to use Zerto and Azure and just really hasn't seen too much of what it's capable of? All right, cool. So I would structured the slide deck to be kind of informative for both of you. So even if you've been using Zerto and Azure, you learn a thing or two about stuff we're doing a little bit new in 7.0. If you've never seen it before, we'll definitely go over the overview, um, just kind of show you what we're doing behind the scenes and how you can actually use Zerto and just get a crash course in it like you would on a demo. So in a nutshell, uh, Azure has been around since 2010, and since 2010 they've really skyrocketed. Um, as you see in my screenshot on the right-hand side, this is taking Q3 2018. They're creeping up really fast behind Amazon Web Services, which really coined the term public cloud. AWS, when they came out swinging with S3, they offered something that no one really could, which was storage at scale or storage for very specific things at scale. But then they started packaging what they were doing inside their own data center, put it out in the market, and really accelerated public cloud adoption because a lot of companies that are having trouble with scale really needed something like that. Microsoft saw the absolute power of this as well and said, all right, you know, we have servers everywhere in the world, like millions of servers were on Microsoft server. Why aren't we doing this as well? So they built a platform that was specifically structured around the services they offer in server and really started taking that story forward and expanding it out into the hyperscale market. So that way people are having trouble scaling their own SQL applications or big data schemas on Microsoft products had something that they could actually do inside the cloud, either leveraging software as a service, infrastructure, or platform as a service, which is essentially just running a SQL database as a service. So they have over 600 services now um, that they offer inside Azure, you know, not necessarily icons that you see in there, but they have tons and tons of things inside Azure. Um, you know, I love Azure Functions in there specifically because you can do little things here and there and just trigger off a whole bunch of cool stuff in there. So that's one of my favorite things I've been using lately. Now, Microsoft and Zerto, we started out actually with a really close relationship with Microsoft. Uh, once we actually said, you know, we're going to support Azure because a lot of our customers are looking for it, Microsoft was pretty game with that because I think that was around the same time they had acquired uh, what is now Azure Site Recovery. So they definitely said, you know, the more the merrier. Even though we had competing products, they were pretty happy to support us because we did something a little bit different. We could actually handle I.O. at scale and we integrated directly into their storage natively. So if anyone's familiar with Azure Site Recovery, Azure Site Recovery is a pretty cool tool. Um, what it does essentially just replicates from an agent in your machine into a vault. Vaults are like uh, idle storage, like kind of like tape or just storage at rest that's just not really spinning too hard. So restore times are a little bit higher. You know, the amount of data you can store in a vault is a little bit limited. So that's specifically why we chose to go into Azure Storage Direct. So we work directly with a storage account rather than a vault. This is one of our biggest differentiators other than we're agentless. So the power of leveraging a storage account is that we can leverage so many parts of the storage account. So not necessarily just spinning disk. We can leverage queue services, table services, um, we can actually use block blob storage to journal out data points. So you can have billions of checkpoints out there across 30 days worth of time for us to flip back to. 
and it's all priced out in Azure uh, Block Blob Storage. Which brings me to my next slide, uh, actually how we use Azure Storage. So Block Blobs are one of our most critical pieces there, and that's actually where our journaling takes place. I'm sure anyone who's new to Zero has heard the term journaling while they've been here. That is really what Zero does well. We don't snapshot, we don't do incrementals or differentials, we journal data. So as it's being written, it's just being redundantly written somewhere else to a point where you can select it, just go back to, say, an hour ago, but with seconds level of granularity between now and an hour ago. So you can always pick and choose where you need to roll back to with the utmost granularity in mind. We also use page blobs. Page blobs is actually where the real replica disk sits. So anyone who's ever used like an incremental or a synthetic full backup technology, this is kind of similar to that, but we have all of our incremental data points that sit in page store or block storage, which is really cheap. Then we have the full replica sitting out in page blob storage. So page blob storage essentially is where the virtual machine would run if you were using unmanaged storage, but that's where we keep the replica until you decide to use it. Now how replication works in Azure is very similar to how it works with vSphere or Hyper-V even, and it's almost identical to how we work with AWS. Storage is just a little bit different in AWS, and that's really all you're going to see is that we're using Amazon's S3 storage. Um, but when you actually make a write in production, what's happening is our replication appliance on-premise tracks that write in your hypervisor, sends it out to the DR site, and in the DR site, we actually have a combination of our manager and our replication appliance sitting in one virtual machine. The reason we did one virtual machine is because out in AWS or out in Azure, more virtual machines you run increase your cost of ownership. This little bad boy can handle a pretty hefty load out there. We actually also have uh, virtual machine scale sets behind it to help expedite failover so this doesn't become a choke point. So we do leverage a lot of parts of the cloud to make sure that a single virtual machine will maintain cost optimization, but it won't inhibit your growth as you keep going out there. So when this thing sees a write coming in from production, it journals it directly into block blob storage. Now, it'll sit there for however long you tell us to keep it there. You want to hold 30 days worth of data? Cool. Any data you write right now will be in there for the next 30 days. Once it gets older than 30 days, it goes directly into its replica, and we read it from our VRA and write it to its replica, or what, what we call internally the mirror. Mirror is essentially what we call one of your uh, replica disks, because it's a mirror image of what you have in production, give or take an hour or 30 days, whatever your, your journal history is. So in a nutshell, just, just a little bit more simplified view of it. You know, write gets protected from the VM. ZCA or VRA catches it, sends it over the WAN and compresses it, writes it into the queue, first in, first out, once it expires its history, it gets written to the replica blob. And that's how you can see the I.O. progressing. As you can tell, I'm great with animations. Just kidding, I totally stole this from somebody internally. Now, from Azure, is a little bit different. You look at what we do inside a hypervisor, we replicate directly from inside the back end of the hypervisor, known as the VM kernel. In Azure and AWS, there really is no kernel that we can get access to, or else that'd be a huge security hole for either Amazon or Microsoft. What we did essentially was we implemented a snapshotting technology, which, you know, at one point we said we will never use snapshots. A lot of us in also said we will never use cloud. <laughs> so here it is. Um, we essentially snap the virtual machine in Azure. Which, the nice part about Azure and AWS, when you snap it, it gives you a lot more information, but it doesn't stun the virtual machine like it can in, in some infrastructures in vSphere. Even in Hyper-V, we see that a snapshot works a little bit different in how the data is quiesced, how it gets what's in memory, and how it compiles a snapshot and stores it. So we've seen a lot more success actually snapping a virtual machine out in a public cloud than you would even on an on-premise hypervisor. Once we grab our snapshot of the virtual machine, we actually take the blocks that we see that have changed, and we actually use our own change block tracking on this, and then we write it into a journal. Journal can be anywhere. It can be inside Azure. It can be inside vSphere. Um, we've had some instances where customers have replicated from Azure to AWS or AWS to Azure, vice versa. You know, we can migrate between public clouds, which is pretty cool. But this is really how we're getting out of Azure if we need to get out. So this is the nice and the uh, most important part, is that if you go into Azure, or even into Amazon, once you start running applications there, you're not really going to know how that's going to be handled long term until you actually do it, which kind of scares a lot of people with cloud. So running actually out in a public cloud and having the option to exit anytime you feel like it is extremely important because then it kind of gets rid of that Hotel California syndrome. You're not wanting to bring your applications out the cloud because you don't want to have to worry about taking it home. 
you can take it home pretty easily and pretty effortlessly as well. <coughs> now, failover in Azure. Um, this is really where a platform like Azure differentiates from a hypervisor. Failing over into a hypervisor can take seconds. It can take maybe a few minutes or so, it depends on your environment. Failing over into Azure and AWS, everything's done through API. So APIs, they're shared. They have to be QoS by Microsoft. They have to maintain their quality of service. Actually, has anyone in here ever used AOL? <laughs> Remember <laughs> dialing in and getting that busy tone? Public cloud makes sure that doesn't happen. So failing over and doing some things inside public cloud might take you a little bit longer than it would on-premise. So it takes you about like two or three minutes to fail over into vSphere. It could easily take us 10 minutes to fail over into Azure. And that's a lot of things we try to get around, but that's just the truth about public cloud. It's not your hypervisor. It's, it's not as uh, powerful in the back end, and it is throttled because of customer um, availability. So failover, it's pretty simple with us in Azure, actually. Uh, the virtual machine here does a lot for the ZCA. It'll actually do a read I.O. from all your journals that you have in Azure, and you can have multiple uh, journals in the same storage account. We actually can support a pretty hefty workload. Typically about uh, 30 to 40 megabytes per second of constant change can be written directly to one of these things. So it takes on a huge load into the journal. VRA service will ask for all this data back from block blob storage, and then it'll write it into a clone of your page blob replica. The reason we do a clone is because if we start appending this data directly to your page blob and you say, oh crap, I need another point in time and roll back, what are we going to do with that, blog, or that page blob there? We're not going to be able to scrub it cleanly or you know, impact part of the guest OS, so we clone it for safety. Good news is if you decide to keep that VM, we just delete the thing that we cloned from. That way, hey, this is now your new production image. Roll back, we delete the clone that we appended. Once we actually do all the clone and the data stitching, we actually bring the virtual machine back to inventory. Um, when you set up a protection group inside Zerto, it'll ask you what network in Azure, what subnet you want to use, what type of virtual machine. So instance and family type, that's all predefined. And you can do that per virtual machine. So if you have a SAP cluster, you can put the SAP databases on their own types of virtual machine. If you have HANA, you can actually have one virtual machine type that's structured for HANA. Let's say four or some crazy amount of terabytes of memory on it. So once it's actually spun up as a virtual machine, it'll link to your page blob that's sitting in your storage account. And typically, that's where it will run, unless you're using premium managed storage. If you're targeting premium managed, it will still land as a page blob. But the way managed storage works is that you essentially take a page blob and you give it to Microsoft to hide behind the scenes, and it fully manages it. If you're using unmanaged storage, it will stay a page blob, but it'll be limited to the uh, constraints of a storage account, which is about 40 disks running at 60 megabytes per second. You can get a pretty hefty amount of workloads done on that, but if you're running at uh, I.O. scale out in Azure, premium managed storage is definitely something to consider targeting. Now, here's just kind of a better visual flow of what promotion looks like with more like the Azure-looking objects in there and stuff, but it's a pretty straightforward flow. Um, we don't really do a lot of craziness behind the scenes there, but we did have to introduce one thing, which was a Microsoft scale set. Anyone here actually use scale sets in their environment? Oh, wow. Whew. We need to start uh, advertising for scale sets here, because these things are awesome. So if you have any applications that you can kind of deploy from a template or anything that really doesn't have a configuration set in stone inside of it that can be easily duplicated, scale sets are awesome. All you do is you deploy a single virtual machine with a rule set to it that says, hey, if my CPU gets to like 90%, spawn off like two virtual machines or something until you get to like 40 or 50. 50 is the maximum. We actually use 40. So that means you'll have 41 of the Zerto appliances that can uh, burst up if you need to on failover or whenever you really need to activate your Zerto data. They use two specific functions here. One is virtual machine scale set in Azure. So we set a rule on a virtual machine when you deploy our ZCA that says, if I start seeing messages pop up that I need to fail over, I can spawn up uh, one virtual machine, or I can spawn up 10 every minute, depending on how aggressively you want to fail over, up to 40. It actually gets those messages from the Azure storage queue. So Azure storage queues are really uh, powerful if you use them correctly. They're really good for like uh, if you've ever used AMQP to transmit data between applications. It's a good AMQP alternative to using cloud as a centralized hub for command messages, control messages, and that's what we use it for, actually. So whenever you fail over and we need to do it really, really, really fast, we just start publishing messages into this queue. 
So that way we can actually start thinking about supporting multiple storage accounts. You can start having a single ZCA get one storage account for journals, one just for replicas. That way we can actually start hammering the I.O. load a lot more. But more importantly, it scales a lot better. Single virtual machine doing this all by itself, it's got a lot of work to do for a single virtual machine with a one gig NIC. So that's mainly why we develop these scale sets out there. Faster RTOs is really what everyone wants, especially in cloud. Again, because you're not running a hypervisor like you are on-premise, we have to kind of give and take what we're willing to accept for an RTO. This is where we said, you know what, we're just going to do a little bit better by using Azure services. So here's more of a deep uh, visual view of actually how we scale over. When you hit the failover button, what's going to happen is the ZCA is going to send a message into the queue that says, hey, I'm failing over these virtual machines here. The Azure queue that's in the same storage account you replicate to um, starts triggering our scale out rules. So we'll see about five or six virtual machines spawn up at first. Then depending on how many messages go in that queue, we'll start seeing increments of 10 every minute or so until we get to 40. The reason we did this is because the machines have a ramp up time. So when you actually fail over, you want everything done as quick as possible. For us, we actually have to spin up the virtual machines, load the code in there. It has to configure itself to the Azure services and then start reading. So we figured, hey, if we're waiting a minute, letting these things spawn up, start consuming work, and then we still need more, we can just wait another minute there, spawn them up, keep going until we maxed out. So this way, when we're processing all the data for failover, we can just burst it all in there. We can actually write pretty aggressively here. We've seen about uh, 20 megabytes per second of constant throughput on pretty small virtual machine block sizes as well as large. Um, and we can handle, actually no, it was 200 megabytes per second, I think, on 20 disks that we were failing over. And they were pretty large sized. Um, so it's pretty aggressive on failover. Um, but more importantly, when you're done failing over, it has a cooldown period of about 10 minutes. So that way, whenever you're done failing over, if you need to roll one back and refail it over again, we don't have to wait for them to burst up again. They're sitting there until they're no longer needed. But 10 minutes for us is saying, all right, yeah, if you're not doing anything for the next 10 minutes, we'll just start scaling these back to reduced on cost. So if I could just add a, um, a thing about cost here. So what invariably happens whenever we talk about adding additional features or resources into a public cloud, uh, one of the very first uh, things that gets asked of us is, well, what is this going to cost me? What is this going to cost my organization? And the answer is that we're going to have one of these running at all times. This is going to cost you approximately $40 per month, if, assuming that you don't do any failover tests. If you do a failover test, that's when you're going to start to see additional workers get spun up, but they only exist for as long as that failover test is actually un you know, undergoing. So in other words, the actual cost of you running that single VM in the cloud is really the thing that you should be concerned about. And then factor in, OK, how many workers am I going to be using up to, you know, so basically 40 times 40 for a, for a limited period of time. Yeah, great point, Alex. Um, mainly because we try to use the cheapest resources possible out in Azure that gives the most performance. Actually, these scale sets are using a DS1 v2 virtual machine. Specifically because we saw the best results at the best cost on that. Uh, it's a single processor, so you'd think, what can you really do with a single processor? Actually, a lot. Especially when we're making writes and we're having to decompress data and write it. That little single processor was the best shot we had. We used versatile machines that had four processors, eight processors. Um, we used high-performance virtual machines. We used burstable. We used A-series. The best performance for dollar ratio that we got was on the DS1 v2. So, yeah, before people ask, um, yes, we did try using Burstable B-Series, and what we determined is that even though it is cheaper on the odd set, we end up getting throttled after running it for a you know, short period of time. So that's the reason why we're on DSV1. Yeah, we saw kind of like the turbo core syndrome happening to where you can burst resources really efficiently for a short period of time on a B-Series machine in Azure. Again, short period of time. We saw very inconsistent results on the B series, so that's why we chose to stick with the D. And actually, the D was pretty close to the same uh, price as the B series, so we really didn't see an increase of ownership on that there. Um, but to Alex's point there, you know, one quick way to calculate it is like, hey, if I need to fail this stuff over and I do a quick test here, it takes me about, you know, say, 15 minutes to bring the virtual machine up. It's got about a five minute ramp up time and a 10 minute cooldown time. So we can factor in 15 minutes to that 15, hey, 30 minutes of that virtual machine's uptime times say like five. That's what we're gonna see. But the most important part is testing. 
So much like Alex said, when you're using this to test, you're going to start seeing the virtual machines activate. Best way to know how long it's going to take your applications to fail over, test it. Because the variable really is how big are the VMs blocks there, how many disks are you bringing out there, how many are activating at one time. But the critical piece is how is Azure going to respond when I do all these things? And that's the part that we really can't control. So how are you going to actually know what your RTOs are? By actually activating a copy and seeing what it tests like. The failover test for us is identical to how we fail over in production. So if you run a single failover test, you'll see what you're going to see in the failover live. The difference is you can keep that VM in a failover live versus a test. Test just rolls back. All right, so one thing I threw in here at the end of all of our kind of deep divey stuff was some best practices that Alex and I actually run into a lot when we're having to implement uh, you know, Azure on, or Zert on Azure or AWS. Um, so some considerations, specifically in networking, is what I get asked a lot. How should I really be designing out in Azure? What should I be building my environment like? You know, it's really to each their own and really what works for you, but these are just some things that I found that work for a majority of my customers I work with. Specifically, just mind your VNets and subnets. You do have a tighter limit in Azure of how many VNets you can throw out there, subnets as well. But if you want true isolation and you don't want to mess around with firewall rules, you can build a VNet just for testing. We allow you to specify an entire VNet and as many subnets as you want, specifically for a testing profile. Now, in at scale, uh, Zero does definitely benefit from having its own VNet. We're talking about scale sets and virtual machines here. So we have our one single virtual machine, a single worker node, and then 40 additional nodes that can spawn up. Those are about 41 IP addresses that we could use at a given time per Zero Cloud Appliance. So definitely take that in consideration when you're carving out your subnet. So you know, whether you're going to use a slash 32 or 24 or 23, your call completely. Just bear in mind how many IP addresses we're going to need, especially if you start saying, hey, I might need three Zerto Cloud appliances. 40 times three, and so many IP addresses we need. Um, so one important thing to also think about is, oops, did they delete that? Better not have. Um, so storage gateways. That's one thing that was in there I think got nixed off there. Um, but if you're using AWS or Azure, definitely always use a storage gateway. Has anyone here actually ever used a storage gateway or a gateway level appliance to a cloud service? All right, so one important thing about the gateway is that it's a free object that you can use inside AWS or Azure that attaches itself to a subnet, and any call you make over API to something like storage or SQL as a service or really any service that they expose as a gateway, it maintains the traffic locally inside Azure's backplane or even Amazon. So it does two things. One, it secures your traffic so it never goes over internet to API. Two, it makes sure it never goes over internet to API so then you don't get charged for it. Think about writing a four terabyte SQL server that changes 20% a day into Azure and then having it go out of Azure, hit an internet API, back in. That's egress charge, ingress charge. For so the, gateways save a ton of money alongside security. For the AWS folks in the room, uh, this is referred to as a VPC endpoint. Um, it's one of the few things that is actually free in the cloud. I yes. see absolutely no, no downside to setting this up outside of 30 seconds of your time. Um, and th those numbers that Kyle mentioned are absolutely accurate. I had a customer that was transferring 104 terabytes um, you know, using, using Zerto. And, I mean, keep in mind that all that Zerto is is an application. We're moving data from point A to point B. They didn't set up that VPC endpoint, and they end up getting whacked in, um, you know, a single day for about $4,000. So, yep. if you don't want to have that conversation with your CTO or your CFO, CFO. <laughs> um, it, might be a, it might be worthwhile the 30-second investment of time. Yeah, and we've seen some cases where, specifically with that customer, and there's one other customer that had something like this before, um, the cloud service providers are pretty relentless about not reimbursing this at all. So it's really one of those mistakes that you learn once the hard way and you never forget it. So that's why I, I was kind of hoping that this made it into the slide deck here because we did some last minute edits, but it might be on another slide somewhere. That's honestly one of my most important things. If you take away anything from this uh, meeting here, Make sure if you're using a service like storage or SQL or anything that's really aggressive or transactional, check to see if there's a service endpoint or a VPC gateway for it. Because it could be the difference between a $20,000 transfer bill or you know, 2,500. So it saves a ton of money and it can make sure you don't have that death by a thousand cuts or one giant bill. One, one giant cut as well. Yeah, one <laughs> giant cut with a data-sized meat cleaver. 
who here has, has home lab or, or played around with either cloud on, the, on their own? So just swipe through a credit card just to do training, et cetera. And of the people who have, have held their hand up, who here has been burned at least once by not turning off a service or, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and you learn how to turn off services real quick, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I got a nice call from Delta one day because they're like, hey, we saw this unauthorized charge on your Delta Amex here. Um, it's different from your regular spending. It's in like $4,000. I was like, what? And that's when I realized my automation account script stopped working and didn't shut down my lab at the end of the day. <laughs> I just Whoops. I had a $50 charge. Yeah, <laughs> no, 4000 But hey, that's poo-poo on me for not checking my analytics to see if my virtual machines are running. So completely my fault. So one thing I also get asked about is, what should I be using to connect to Azure? VPN, Express Route? Same goes for Amazon, actually. Um, before Alex and I took over these roles, this is a very common question we get for both platforms. How do I get there? What's the most efficient way to get there? You know, some people just think, oh, carving out a VPN will work fine, or you know, Express Routes will work good, or a Direct Connect. There's pros and cons to both, and you really do have to take a look at what they're both capable of, but more importantly, what they're not capable of, and make the decision based on what you need. So importantly with VPNs, they're pretty bandwidth capable. Um, however, they don't really guarantee it. They offer you that bandwidth as a suggested amount. So it can support one gigabit per second. You're not entitled to a gigabit per second constantly. So one of the biggest things is that you can definitely be throttled down or you can hit a bottleneck because it's not necessarily running through a dedicated provider. Express routes, however, are. They're dedicated fiber lines that are directly connected to the Azure backplane through a service provider network. You get the SKU through a service provider that's brokered through Microsoft. So that way the service provider maintains control over the line as well as you, but it just connects into the Azure backplane and Azure can actually broker all your data directly in. Can be very cost effective. I know people think Express routes to kid fiber, extremely expensive. In some cases, yes. There's two types. There is metered, there is unmetered. Unmetered express routes mean that Microsoft's not gonna look at what you're sending in or out. They just charge you for having that direct connect up or that express route up as much as possible. Whatever you send in and out is completely your business. You don't pay ingress or egress charges, period. Metered, you pay egress charges only, which makes it pretty cost effective if you're not sending a lot of data out. So if you choose to move data in and out of Azure quite frequently, Unmetered express routes have their perks there. They are expensive, but so are egress charges when you pay them a lot. It's kind of death by a thousand cuts again. You do it frequently, it will definitely rack up a bill. So what's cheaper, running an express route unmetered or just failing out you know, a couple terabyte servers about six or seven times a month? Depends on what you want to do. So more importantly, uh, VPNs, if you want the smallest RPO possible with Zerto, or in general, then it's a good thing to have. But if you're required to have the smallest RPO or the least amount of data gap possible, invest in an express route or a direct connect. It will pay off in dividends because it definitely guarantees you the data that you're paying for and you can use it when you need to use it. So that's one of the differentiators there is that what are you required to have versus what do you want to have? If the you know, RPO start escalating because we have bandwidth fluctuations and your business can actually afford a little bit of a gap growing here and there, Cool, VPNs are pretty cost effective. Again, you do pay for egress on those, but it's really what you need to do and what your requirements are. Always think about what are your business requirements when looking at what you're gonna leverage in Azure or AWS. Now, storage, um, this is one of the things that's a little bit tricky in Azure, just because storage accounts, there's a couple of different versions we can use now. We specifically support general purpose V1, that's what we land in for one specific reason, and that is cost. If you use a GPV2 storage account, it can cost you 40 times more than a GPV1. Really the only differentiators is it can handle 50,000 IOPS in there, and it has archive tearing and block blob storage. That's it. So why pay 40 times the amount for something that we're never really gonna leverage? The IO capacity would be great, but 20,000 IOPS is pretty capable. Yes, you do have to scale this out a little bit more manual with storage accounts, having 20,000 IOP limits, but paying 40 times the amount for storage that we have a like competitor for, we just don't see the point in supporting it yet. Microsoft, however, is gonna be changing a lot of things to GPV2 eventually, so we could see those costs go down. If it becomes effective enough for us to say, you know what, we're willing to offer you this to you guys and it will not rack up a million dollar bill for you, Cole will support it. 
But GPV-1, it works the same as uh, GPV-2 for what we use it for. Um, we can still land in a page blob. We can elevate it to premium managed. Um, eventually, when Ultra comes along and stuff like that, we might introduce the capacity for Ultra one day. Who knows? GPV-1 can import into Ultra. It's not part of the storage account itself. So one other thing, too, regarding GPV-1 versus GPV-2. So ASR, so Azure Site Recovery, if anyone uses that, you're probably going to GPV-1. Um, that is actually the recommendation from the ASR engineers as well. So even though Microsoft as an organization would prefer that everyone use GPV-2, um, even ASR will go to GPV-1 for the same exact reason. So just keep that in mind if, if, in case that question comes up or you're pushed on it by you know somebody. Yeah, exactly. Um, brings me to my last point here as well. Um, the well, I saw my gateway finally made it down there. Um, but the third bullet point here is another one that I really want everyone in here to take away. Um, knowing what your data is doing behind the scenes, what you're putting down to disk, what your actual I.O. per second is, what your megabytes per second are, um, what your throughput is on your applications on the NIC level, that's what saves you in cloud. A lot of these things, I think, are things that we've never had to really look at in depth because we do kind of ballpark sizing on SANS, we do ballpark sizing on backup copies. We're never really dinged on like the per gigabyte per second level unless we're actually using like a hosted service. So knowing what your VMs are putting down to disk, what they're putting down to resources at a very granular level will absolutely save you the most money running in cloud. And running as intelligent of metrics as you can in your environment will definitely help no matter even if that costs money. It could save a huge cost on the road, actually. Having a massive I.O. burst in Azure running down to disk, that could actually ramp a huge tab on you, too. So just knowing what your environment is doing and putting down to disk is critical. And yeah, my ZCA uh, subnet here, <laughs> the Azure Storage Gateway, definitely make sure you have one of those things. And having Zero in its own subnet, you can actually link the gateway directly to the subnet. So that will help it scale out. So you only have one storage gateway you need that can service multiple appliances for Zerto. Um, so those are just a little bit of tidbits that I like to kind of put out there for my customers that figured anyone new or experienced with Zerto can probably benefit from. And with this, really, um, we are doing the Azure certification program here. Um, if you guys want to get some hands-on with Zerto on Azure, we have plenty of labs for that. The instructor-led labs were definitely a registration-only thing. We do have labs on demand on a first-come, first-serve basis right across the hall. So definitely, if you guys want to start uh, putting your hands on the software there and getting for a little experience with Azure and Zerto, please do. Best way to do it, because we're hosting it here and it's hosted in a lab environment, you don't have to pay for it. With that, I'm going to turn it over to you guys, because I think I have talked enough uh, over here for you guys. I definitely want to get your questions. I want to make sure that if there's anything you guys need that I answer it for you, as well as Alex here. Um, so we'll walk around the room with a microphone. Just kind of put your hand up there if you do have a question, and I'll make sure someone gets you a mic. There we go. Let's say, don't be shy. Sorry. The, uh, the, the CCA or the, the the uh, management appliance in Azure, is it in the data path for replication? In the data pack? Is it in the path. data path? It's like if I shut it down, does replication stop? Yes. Yeah, so the ZCA itself in the appliance is actually what's putting the data down to disk. Right. So if you shut the appliance down, that actually eliminates the data flow. It also prevents it from hitting the, uh, the WAN charges there. It's also the VRA. Yeah, exactly. We don't scale out the VRA or anything yet, so. All right, don't be shy, guys. Come on. I know you got some questions. You just hand him the mic. You can come up and save, too. No, it's a, <laughs> what if I have a VM that has more than 40 disks? As far as, like... As far as replicating it, your, your slide indicated that, that uh, the storage account was limited to 40 disks. Yeah, so that's essentially 40 disks running at maximum capacity in a storage oh. account. That's all a storage account can really support, is, like, if you're running at 60 megabytes per second constantly, it can only service 40 disks maximum. If you have a, a max of, like, say, 64 disks, which is what the controller limit is in vSphere, chances are they're probably not all running at 60 megabytes per second. So you do have to look at the total workload of the entire VM and how many megabytes per second, but also how many IOPS. You could have a lot more IOPS than you have disk throughput. So never forget about your disk level IOPS versus the megabytes per second. Because that's about 20,000 on the storage account. 
got one back there. If uh, we put Zerto in its own subnet, uh, then do, do you guys handle the NSGs or do we have to do the NSGs for the ports in between? How do we lock it down? Um, so yeah, you guys do have to do the NSGs. Um, we, a lot of the administrators have full control over like the security gateways and stuff like that. Um, our ports are heavily published, so you can just open the ports on the NSG there and restrict any other traffic on there. Um, for the scale sets, so we do need internet levels of traffic out there, so you know, over secure HTTP, you can definitely uh, put that in the firewall rules there. Um, I'm working on a few documentation pieces on how to like, you know, script some things here and there if you wanted to auto deploy like an NSG. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at, yeah. Yeah, so you can definitely build your own scripts or, or do whatever you want through Azure as well on your own. We just don't do it natively in the product. Um, but those are some things I'm trying to get out for administrators to use as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, something to remember is that Zerto, I, I said it earlier actually, Zerto is just an appliance. We move data from point A to point B. However you do that, like whatever path that that data takes, we don't want to be the ones that limit that. Um, so if, if you have like a special need that you know, needs to be automated, that's, that's one thing. But ultimately, it is the, the end user's ultimate responsibility to have the plumbing already in place before you start replicating. Or at least before you start doing a failover. You run in uh, GovCloud? Yes, we yes. do run in GovCloud. Yep, AWS and Azure are fully supported on GovCloud. Um, I think there's only like one or two regions like in the world that we ever have a problem with. And it's usually something related to Germany or China because they have really tight regulations on API. So uh, I think we do work with those regions now. But you know, always just make sure that the availability of whatever region you want to target doesn't have any like geographic restrictions or government level limitations. But for us with GovCloud, it's, it was just another API set. We had it out in a patch in like 4.5. So been around for a while. We actually have uh, some state level institutions running out in GovCloud and Zerto. So we ran into a challenge where Zerto is usually a agentless application, right? So Zerto doesn't know what service is running in the agent. So when we do the failover server, does it come up online in Azure? And we found out multiple times that XYZ services are not running or not configured correctly. So do you guys have any tool to validate to make sure the server will come up online OK? Yeah, so this is kind of a touchy subject in general with converting into Azure, specifically because what Azure and AWS as well do is when you import a VM, it reconfigures a lot of the drivers in the back end, so storage controllers and stuff like that. So it really depends on what services and why they're failing. Um, it, their variable just could be an environmental variable inside the VM that changes when it is converted into that virtual machine's uh, architecture and the drivers are installed. I've seen this happen with a pair of virtual controllers as well with some disks going offline. It seems to be you know, application dependent as well as operating system dependent, but we don't have any kind of like health checkers inside that are looking for services like that yet. Um, we try to remain as agentless as possible because that definitely introduces complications and then having to orchestrate into that virtual machine from outside also has complications. So for us having a health check mechanism, like will we have it in the product? I don't really know, honestly. Can we have something that you can use for a health check? Probably. I'll need to look into something as far as can we set something up to trap a certain service if it doesn't start correctly and alert you. A lot of possibilities in cloud, so there's a possibility we could engineer something like this, but maybe not have it directly incorporated in the product. You should come talk to our product managers. They would love to hear this sort of, of, um, of feedback. They are all here. And we also do have a feature request portal on Zerto. So if you go to zerto.com slash myzerto, you'll see there that there is an option for you to submit um, ideas. So those go directly to our product management. They do review them. Um, so again, they are here. So if, there, if you have an idea, we'd love to hear it. We'd love to capture it. So please come and uh, go to the, uh, the product management booth. Yeah, and also on that feature request portal that Alex is talking about, um, definitely take a poke through there and see if there's any features that are currently in there that you'd love to see. We use a voting mechanism, essentially. So customers can vote so we can see how many people would actually use these things. So if you see a feature out in there that you really want, vote it up if you really want to see it in the product. Because the more people that want it, the more likely that we'll actually put it on our roadmap there. Our biggest focus is just making sure we're not building bloatware. If it's software that our, our customers actually want to use, absolutely. We just don't want to throw a whole bunch of stuff in there that ends up complicating the situation as well. 
so i will give you one example like dhcp service for example has to be running in order for servers to come up in azure right yep in our environment we don't have that running yeah so we use asr and zerto both and asr you have intelligent built in it bring up the services while coming up in azure zerto does not so this is just one of the example and there might be more multiple thing like azure agent for example has to on the linux machine some linux machine doesn't have that default yeah. so this is this is kind of a couple of situation where we ran into a trouble where server just doesn't come up so i think these are the default thing required in azure in order for servers to come up so why can't uh, you guys just build some intelligence to enable that feature while it's coming up in the azure again it may be a future request but this is a must requirement yeah i would definitely talk to our product managers about that because if it's something that you can definitely see other people benefiting from then yeah it's a very good chance we can develop something like that the reason we haven't is just because there hasn't been a lot of drive for something like that yet we do support very specific versions of linux so our azure and aws so if you are running a lot of linux intense applications double triple check that compatibility guide because chances are it could be an unsupported version that the stack isn't starting right because we didn't actually certify that or we ran into a problem with that distro going into Azure or AWS even. So that's one thing to check, but definitely um, our booths that we have around there, our product management team always has people there, so definitely uh, come pick their ear there. Other questions? No? No? No questions? Nobody in the back over here anywhere? No? Should we okay. uh, talk about 9 o'clock tomorrow? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over to Alex because he is going to be doing an AWS demonstration tomorrow. So take it away. Yeah. So for those of you who are going to be um, going to be here tomorrow, um, I'm basically going to be doing the same exact thing that we just did here today, that like Kyle uh, did for Azure, except we'll be talking about AWS. So for those of you that are interested in knowing about how Zerto works in AWS, um, talking about the differences in architecture, how to get it running, best practices. Um, you know, if you want to, if you want to, you know, send send fireballs our way because something isn't working the way they expect it to. Um, oh, oh boy! That's what I see you guys fight. Google. <laughs> really, Dundee? Really? <laughs> I brought the wrong hat. Yeah, we were in the airport and I took a selfie and I had like this little black hat on and everything too. And I was like, what people think people look like in the south, and then when people are looking at them like in the south. <laughs> rude so to answer your question um, I think that so I'm going to give you I'm going to give you two answers okay so the first answer is that that's a loaded question it very much is <laughs> so that, that's a loaded question because AWS and, and Azure and Google Cloud for that matter well we don't support Google Cloud yet and even IBM Cloud um, so, so the thing about all those uh, platforms is that they do certain things better than others, and certain things that you know they're just they're, that's not their strength. So, AWS, in my opinion, is more of a development type cloud. It's a cloud where if you are looking to put cloud native tools up in there, build from the ground up. If the world is a big development shop, then AWS is, is your friend, right? Now that being said, EC2, of course, is one of the biggest services outside of S3, which by the way, we use both of those. Um, so in terms of which cloud is better, it really comes down to what your use case is. If you're lifting, lifting and shifting um, applications into a cloud, if you want somebody else's ecosystem, then Zerto functions a little bit more seamlessly than uh, in, in Azure than it does in AWS. So that being said, um, we work in both. We're constantly improving both as well. Um, so this could be a very different conversation in six months, nine months, et cetera. Yeah, I think this conversation next year, as far as what we can do in both clouds, we're pretty hell-bent on tightening that gap there with Amazon and Azure. There's just things we were able to get done easier because there's a lot of things that was booming in Azure at the time and Microsoft was investing a lot in new APIs and really just taking a pull at when their partners wanted to go inside Azure. Um, so we got really rapid turnarounds as far as like developing uh, incremental snapshotting region to region so we can support region to region replication there. Um, we're still working on developing something like that with IO1 and GP2 because different animals really. Like Alex said, they're way different platforms. Azure is a good platform for somebody who's a predominant Windows user, and you want to maintain that relationship going forward with Microsoft. If you're a heavy Linux shop, heavy developers, you'd like to develop a lot of crazy in-house apps that hyperscale and go all over the place, 
AWS is your cloud, and maybe even Google Cloud, because Google Cloud's great for developers. Microsoft is great because it's Microsoft's cloud, so if you use Microsoft servers, what well, works better with Microsoft than Microsoft, really? Got a question back there. Can you put your hand back up? Sorry. I can, I can start here. Yeah. So you have to determine what it is that you're, that, what, what, what problem are you attempting to solve here? If the problem that you are attempting to solve is that you want to have a traditional backup where you are taking one backup every day and you're keeping it for, say, three to seven years, then, and you want, say, integration with things like um, you know, exchange servers or SQL servers, basically in guest type of type of functionality. That's where that's where something like a traditional backup product like Veeam is stronger than us today. Um, if you're looking for as tight RPO and RTOs as possible, if you're looking to move data from point A to point B uh, in a seamless manner, it requires very little setup and very little carrying and feeding without snapshotting, because that's how Veeam does it, then Zerto is better. So it really comes down to what goal are you trying to, are you trying to accomplish here? What is your problem that you are trying to solve? So if it's, if it's long-term retention, we've got a long-term retention piece. But if you need, you know, if you need what I'll consider, you know, heavy lifting backup functionality, then, you know, you got to take that in consideration. Yeah, and even inside Azure, where we use snapshots to go region to region, the key differentiator between us and Veeam is our journal. That's always been our key differentiator outside of we don't use agents. The journal is our biggest differentiator from really any competitor out there. The journal itself just takes data in as we're snapping and writing it. But the way it's written into the journal is always making sure that when we read that snapshot, we take in mind the I.O. sequencing and make sure it gets written into the journal the exact same way we captured it. Even though we can't time snapshots identically with each other, we can still make sure that what's inside that snapshot gets written to a, a block blob storage object if we're going Azure to Azure, or a VMDK thin disk for the journal on a, a vSphere site. So again, that's when you're making a decision, much to Alex's point, what is the problem you're trying to solve? That journal can solve a lot of problems if you need a really tight RTO and even RPO, because if we're going between region to region in Azure, we still have two to five minutes of data loss between the sites. That's with snapshotting. And we don't maintain a snapshot tree either. It's the same block blob and page blob architecture on the DR site. Once we read the snap data, it gets deleted. And it's there for a few seconds. So I know that we're, we're getting close. I think we're, we're actually over right now, are we? OK, so I'm gonna, we're going to uh, end the session. But Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. If you have any other additional questions, please come and see Kyle and myself. We'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Yeah. Thanks Thank for coming. You guys. We'll see you tomorrow at 9 o'clock for AWS. <laughs>